Between the years 6 and 4 BC, Jesus was born in Israel. He came to bring peace and goodwill to men. The Christmas of 1873, the Spafford family faced unimaginable pain. But God gave them peace and a song that brought peace to millions of people. The family later traveled to Jerusalem to bring peace and goodwill to the people there. They watched a Christmas miracle unfold as Jerusalem was freed from the Turks. Then, on a Christmas Eve, they took in a baby boy after his mother died. And that led to the opening of an orphanage that still exists today. They chose to love, serve, rescue, and bring peace throughout two world wars and conflicts. This is the story of the Spafford family who were used of God to bring peace to the souls of those who faced unimaginable pain, the peace of Jesus Christ. Welcome back to the Church History Podcast. I'm your host, Laura Lee Siemens, and this is our fourth episode in the Zionist series. In our first episode, we covered the story of the Church and Israel, and the history of Israel from Abraham until the late 1800s. In our second episode, we told the story of Mark Twain and the valley of dry bones he found when he visited the Holy Land. In our third episode, we talked about Cyrus Schofield, his conversion to Christianity, and his work in the church that included the Schofield Bible, which inspired the church to want to see Israel re-established as a nation. In this episode, we're talking about one family that witnessed the Zionist movement from the front stage. The story starts in New York City, 1828. In the bustling streets of New York City in 1828, the air is thick and there's this energetic hum of progress. There's a promise of a growing nation. Horse-drawn carriages are clattering along cobblestone streets, weaving through patchwork of markets. And tucked between brick buildings and gas-lit streetlights are cries of street vendors selling their wares in an aroma of fresh bread that wafts from bakeries. As the sun dips below the horizon, it casts long shadows over the city, and there's a flicker of oil lamps and a distant clatter of families in their homes. It was a time when the city's heartbeat mirrored the pulse of a nation on the brink of a transformation. The United States Senator Martin Van Buren was elected governor of New York, and in nine years, he would become the eighth president of the United States. It was into this world that Horatio Gates Spafford was born on October 20th, 1828. It was 33 years later that he married Anna Larson, an immigrant from Norway. They were married in Chicago. Anna and Horatio started their family, and they served God and kept God at the center of their family. God blessed Horatio, and he was a successful lawyer in a large law firm. Then he was made the senior partner. The couple was a well-respected, wealthy family living the city life in Chicago. But they always kept God first. They opened their home to anyone in need, and they served in their local church. Anna and Horatio worked alongside Dwight L. Moody. We covered the life of D.L. Moody in past episodes. The couple was very involved in the evangelistic ministry along with Moody. They had five children, three little girls and a little boy. The girls were Anna, Margaret Lee, Elizabeth, and a little boy named Horatio Jr. Life was perfect. Then. One day, four-year-old Horatio became sick. The doctor came to check on him and told the family he had scarlet fever. Anna 
and Horatio sat at the bedside of their four-year-old, praying for his recovery and trying to help him get better. But sadly, Horatio Jr. passed away. The family was devastated. Shortly after the death of Horatio Jr., Anna found herself pregnant again, and they gave birth to another little girl named Tanetta. In 1871, Horatio was given a chance to invest in a real estate investment in the north part of Chicago. Horatio used all their family savings and bought the real estate. Then, one Sunday, they noticed the sky looked different. They went home to bed and were awakened by people yelling to get out of the city. All of Chicago was on fire. The fire raged through the city. 300 people were killed and 100,000 were homeless. After the fire, when Horatio and Anna returned, they found their home gone and all of the homes Horatio had spent their savings on. They were broke. The church was also burned to the ground. D.L. Moody, although heartbroken, turned his attention to the people in need. Horatio and Anna followed his lead and began to serve the families who had lost everything. After two years, they had rebuilt their home. Although they didn't have the money they had before and they had lost a lot, they did build their lives back. The Moody's had traveled to England to speak and had written to them that things had not gone as planned, but instead of giving up, they had found a new place to speak. The crowds were growing, and they wanted help. You can hear that story in our episode of Moody. Horatio and Anna agreed to travel with their family to England to help Moody and to see their friend. On the day of the trip, the law office, where Horatio was the senior partner, had an emergency. They needed all the partners to be part of the case, which meant Horatio could not leave. He told his family to go ahead without him and that he would come as soon as the case was finished and they would have a great time in England together. On a cold November morning in 1873, he kissed his wife and four daughters goodbye. Anna was 12, Maggie was 7, Bessie was 4, and Tinito was 18 months old. They boarded the SS Ville de Havre. The boat left the harbor in New York and was headed to France, which would be the first stop for the family. The trip started well. The boat was decorated for Christmas, and the family was excited. They would celebrate Christmas in Paris. On November 22nd, Anna tucked her girls into bed. They knelt on the bed to say their prayers. They then climbed into bed and soon fell asleep. At two in the morning, a loud crash toppled the children out of bed. A Scottish vessel had hit the SS Ville de Havre. Anna and her girls ran to the top deck, trying to find a lifeboat that would have space. People were already jumping into the icy waters. As Anna tried to find a lifeboat with room, the crowds pushed and pulled, and her two oldest, Anne, 12, and Maggie, 7, were separated from her. She began searching for them frantically, but could not find them anywhere. And then, suddenly, a wave washed over the deck, and Anna was pulled overboard, still holding on to Bessie 4, an 18-month-old Tanita. She held Bessie's hand in the water, trying to keep her head above the water, but she felt Bessie's hand slip through her fingers, and Bessie disappeared under the water. Then, baby Tanita also slipped from her arms. She tried to swim to her, but she saw her little white lace nightgown float away. And then Anna also lost consciousness. She felt herself dying and knew she would be with her daughters soon. In just 12 minutes, the boat sank to the bottom of the ocean, and with it, all four of the girls. Anna was found unconscious on a wood plank floating in the ocean. She was pulled into a lifeboat and eventually regained consciousness only to find out she had not died with her daughters. 
she was put onto another boat and taken to Wales. There, she sent word to her husband with a telegram that said, Saved alone, what shall I do? Horatio received this telegram. This is the 1800s. He couldn't call her or hop on a plane or FaceTime her. Knowing Anna was alone in all her grief, he had to board a boat and travel to Wales. She did have friends. The Moody's were there with her, but she needed her husband. As he traveled toward his wife, the boat's captain came to see him. They stood on the bridge, and the captain told him they were about to travel over the spot where his family's boat had sunk. Horatio stood looking over the water. It was still that day. And somewhere under this still water were the bodies of his daughters. He was overcome with grief. He watched the waters until they had passed over the location and then returned to his cabin. There he wrote these words. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, you have taught me to say, it is well. It is well with my soul. He closed his notebook. He wrote to Anna's sister and said, On Thursday last, we passed over the spot where she went down, in mid-ocean, the waters three miles deep, but I do not think of our dear ones there. They are safe, dear lambs. Meanwhile, Anna was with the ministry team working with D.L. Moody. She told Pastor Nathaniel Wise, God gave me four daughters. Now they have been taken from me. Someday I will understand why. She wondered why she had not also died. She wanted to have died with her daughters. But she heard God say to her, You were saved for a purpose. She remembered something she had said years before, before even Horatio Jr. had died, when everything was perfect. A friend had noticed how much she loved to praise and worship God, and the friend had said, It's easy to be grateful and good when you have so much, but take care that you are not a fair weathered friend to God. In that day, Anna had promised God she would love and serve him in blessing or pain. And since that time, so much pain. Horatio eventually joined Anna, and they grieved together. When Horatio heard the preaching and the singing of the services with D.L. Moody, he was inspired to write more from the poem he had started while on the boat. Though Satan should buffet, though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and shed his blood for my soul. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, oh, my soul. In an act of grace and mercy, Anna found herself pregnant again. They had a little girl named Bertha. And then they had a little boy. They named him Horatio, Jr., after his father and his brother, their first son who died at age four. The family was back in Chicago and trying to find a way to put their shattered life back together. They were hearing the preaching of Schofield and the stories of missionaries. They had given their money to mission work, but, but they were struggling to figure out how to make their life feel right again. Then they heard of a mission opportunity. A group of Christians were moving to the Holy Land. At this time, it was called Palestine. The group would move to the Holy Land to help care for the Jewish people living in the area. They had heard stories of how difficult life was in the Holy Land. The group of Christians were going to help set up a settlement in the Holy Land, help the Jewish people with their farming, and prepare the land for the future God had planned for his people. Horatio and Anna could not wait for Jesus' return. 
They waited anxiously and excitedly, wanting God to find them serving him. Horatio wrote this, O Lord, haste the day when my faith shall be sight and the clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall resound and the Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. While they were considering moving, Anna had another baby girl named Grace. So she was getting ready to travel across the ocean with three children. But before they could leave, Horatio Jr. became sick. He was four, the same age his brother of the same name had died. They sat by his bed praying also. But Horatio Jr. passed away at the age of four, the same age as his brother. Anna's heart was broken. She had now lost five children. Anna and Horatio took their two daughters, a newborn and a toddler, and headed for the Holy Land. In the Holy Land, they didn't live as a wealthy lawyer on the rich side of Chicago. They lived on a house on the old city wall in between Herod's and Damascus Gate. They were there to serve. In my episode, Mark Twain and the Dry Bones, we saw what Israel looked like during this time. It was a desert of dry bones. Nothing was growing. It was a place full of beggars and depression. This is the land the Spafford family was making a home. With two small daughters and a broken heart, Anna settled into her new home to mend her broken heart by serving the people of Jerusalem. Here, they served people experiencing poverty, took sick into their homes to feed them, and brought homeless children into their homes. They were the hands and feet of Jesus, loving his children. They did mission work differently. They didn't go out into the streets and try to make converts. Instead, they built relationships, serving and loving everyone who needed help. They wanted to build friendships. Although the group was all American Christians and called to themselves an American colony, they were not trying to claim the land for America nor for Christianity. There was no debate that the land was the ancient land of Israel. They saw the places where the heroes of the Old Testament had lived. They walked on the streets that had been built by the Israeli nation. They traveled through the gates the kings of the Old Testament had built. The country was called Palestine because Rome had tried to erase the name of the God of Israel changing the name and humiliating the people of Israel by choosing the name of the ancient enemies. The group had been eliminated hundreds of years before, the Philistines. There was no doubt or question that this was the land of Israel, and Spafford loved the people of Israel. They also served the Arabs and Turkish people who lived in the area. They helped anyone who needed them and showed the love of Jesus to everyone they met. Jerusalem had been the eye of the Crusades and had been controlled by Muslims, the Church, and finally the Turks under Ottoman rule. However, the Ottoman rule was on a decline. You can learn more about this in our episodes on the Crusades and on the episode where the Greeks take their land back from the Ottomans. This Christian American group believed that Jesus was going to return shortly. This belief didn't make them want to hide away in secret. The belief spurred them on to finish the race strong. They saw in the Old Testament verses, such as Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 25 to 26. Thus says the Lord God, When I gather the house of Israel from the peoples among whom they are scattered, and will manifest my holiness in them in the sight of the nations, then... They will live in their land, which I gave to my servant Jacob. They will live in it securely, build houses, plant vineyards, and live securely when I execute judgments upon all who scorn them, round about them. Then they will know that I am the Lord their God. Horatio, Anna, and the others in the mission who had moved to Jerusalem were planning on serving the house of Israel, 
as they returned to the land of Jacob. They would help them build houses. They would help them plant vineyards. The land of dry bones that Ezekiel had seen in his vision that was going to come back to life. Horatio and Anna wanted to be there to see the miracle unfold and to serve the people whom God was calling back to the land. They established a colony, farmed, and lived among the Jews, helping in whatever way they could. As the people began to know Horatio and Anna and their story, they were struck by the strength of the family, and they gave the family the name Overcomer. The same time Horatio and Anna arrived in Jerusalem, another man, Elizer ben Yehuda, had moved to Jerusalem from Russia. He was a cultural Zionist who had a dream to bring the dead language of Hebrew back to life. He and his wife only spoke Hebrew in their home, and they began to find other families that agreed to do the same thing. A Hebrew colony was created as well, with a school that would teach the children in Hebrew. This caused conflict with the spiritual Zionists, who thought the Hebrew language was a holy language that could only be used when reading the Torah or praying. Horatio and Anna were living right there in the middle of all this tension, and their goal was to bring peace through showing love and mercy to everyone they met. As Horatio and Anna served, they met Jacob Elihu, a Jewish teenager boy born in Romalia, but orphaned after his family had moved to Jerusalem. They adopted Jacob and brought him into their family. Jacob did become a Christian. However, he kept all his Jewish traditions, celebrating the holidays and Jewish observations. Jacob was amazingly smart. He spoke five languages fluently, and he was really excited about Jerusalem's archaeology and would spend his free time looking through tunnels and finding places to explore in the old parts of the holy city. One day, he was exploring a tunnel in Orpa Hill. What he didn't know was that this was a tunnel King Hezekiah had used to bring water into the city. While exploring the tunnel, he found an inscription chiseled into the stone. This became known as a Siloam Tunnel Discovery and is one of the most famous discoveries of the Jewish land. In 1885, the American group was working to prepare the land to plant more trees. It was extremely hot that day, and one man fell in the heat. He had a heat stroke and died. He was the first in the group to die, but not the last. The next year, the leader of the group died and Horatio stepped up as the new leader of the group. Then, tragedy hit the family once again. At the age of 50, Horatio became ill with malaria. Anna sat by her husband's bedside, trying to keep him alive. But he died on September 25, 1888. This was the third time she had sat at Horatio's bedside. Her first son, her second son, and now her husband. She had been on the ship when her daughters had slipped from her arms and disappeared under the water. It was Anna who experienced so much of the trauma. She buried her husband in the Mount Zion Cemetery in Jerusalem. Anna, her daughters, and their adopted son decided to stay in Jerusalem. The American colony then asked her to take leadership of the colony. Anna was well respected by the Christians the Jews, and the Arabs living in the area. Everyone knew this was the person to go to if you needed anything, she would help you. Life in Jerusalem was about to become extremely dangerous and difficult. In 1908, the Ottoman Empire was beginning to fall. In our past episode, we discussed the end of the Ottoman rule in Greece, and I'll put a link to that in the show notes. As the winds of World War I swept across the Ottoman Empire, it began to cast a shadow over the ancient city of Jerusalem and Palestine. The stage was set for a very difficult chapter in history. Anna and her daughters and adopted son had a front row seat to all of it. 
As the war began to unfold in the fall of 1914, the Ottoman Empire aligned with Germany and conflict and stress began spreading through the narrow alleys and historic landscapes of the Holy City. Battles were fought in that city. The British, fighting against the Ottomans, established their base in Egypt. Everybody wanted the land of Jerusalem, and there was a great fear that the Holy Land and its historic buildings and landmarks would be destroyed. And amid all this chaos, the American colony was set up in the heart of Jerusalem. Anna led the group, and they found themselves stuck between the Ottomans and the British. And in that land, there were groups of Arabs and Jews and Christians that had gotten along fairly well, and they suddenly began distrusting each other. No one knew where anyone else stood in the conflict. Anna let her colony know and reminded them why they came to Jerusalem. They were there to serve, and they would serve anyone who needed help. They set up a soup kitchen to feed anyone looking for help. They helped wounded soldiers on both sides of the conflict. And they trusted God's plan for this city, his plan for this land, and his plan for the people. The Ottoman military commanders came to Anna and asked the colony to take a special role in the war. They were asked to be the official photographers showing the war in Jerusalem since the colony was American and neutral. But then, the United States officially joined the Allies in the spring of 1917, and the American colony's mission took on added significance. While the war shifted and the Allied forces advanced, the colony gave its hand once again to anyone who was suffering. They eventually took responsibility over the Turkish military hospitals, providing care to all of the wounded. And Anna continued to lead the colony. She was a beacon of Jesus' compassion, navigating all the complexities of the war. The colony had to carry special documents given to them from the Ottomans to show that they were allowed to travel on the land. The Turks had made sure only those with permits were allowed to travel inside the city. So Anna and her children had to make sure that their documents were with them at all times as they worked in the soup kitchen and the hospitals. Anna's stories seem to have Christmas stories that mark significant changes. Her daughters had died during the Christmas season as they'd been traveling. And in 1917, she witnessed a world-changing event on December the 9th, 1917. As the dawn was painting the Jerusalem sky on that morning of December 9th, 1917, there was a shift in history about to unfold in front of their eyes. She could hear the sounds of them marching as they walked out the ancient streets. The Ottomans had left the city, and the British were coming, but there were two days of an eerie silence. The Turks were gone after holding control of the city since the year 1517. The land had been stripped bare, and had become a valley of dry bones. But in the years Anna lived there with her family, she watched the land start to come back to life. Jerusalem now had an overall Jewish majority. The Hebrew language, considered a dead language for years, had come back to life, and people were speaking it in their day-to-day -day lives. A miracle I'll discuss in a future episode in our Zionist series. The land was no longer dead. Jewish families had purchased farms and trees were growing, and rural communities had been built. The war had not destroyed the people or the land. Instead, you could feel a nation being born. But now, everyone waited to see what would happen as the British came to take control. The Turks left behind a few soldiers to guard the Dome of the Rock. But other than that, it was two days of silence. Then, after two days, General Edmund Allenby, who had assumed command of the Western Front, 
led the British troops to enter the sacred city. They entered with reverence. They didn't storm the city. They walked in humbly, knowing they were walking on holy ground. The city was now under British control. Anna witnessed the very quiet occupation. The British were not trying to claim the land. They raised no allied flags and allowed the Dome of the Rock guardianship to stay. General Edmund had a proclamation delivered in seven languages, English, French, Arabic, Hebrew, Russian, and Greek. Martial law was declared, but there was a promise that Jerusalem would be safeguarded and respected with all its sacred buildings, monuments, and holy sites. Here is what his decree said. Since your city is regarded with affection by the adherents of three of the great religions of humanity, and its soil has been consecrated by the prayers and pilgrims of multitudes of devout people, I make it known to you that every sacred building, monument, holy spot, shrine, traditional site, endowment, or customary place of prayer will be maintained and protected according to the existing customs and beliefs of those whose faith they are sacred. News reached Rome and London. Jerusalem was no longer in the hands of the Turks. Churches rang their bells. It was a time of celebration after a horrific war. Then the British Mandate came one year later in 1918. The British Mandate was when the United Kingdom was responsible for governing and overseeing the territory of Palestine after World War I. This happened from 1920 until 1948, and during this period, the British were tasked with helping the area develop and prepare it for self-government. However, it also led to a lot of tensions between different groups living in Jerusalem, especially the Jewish people and the Arabs. Anna and the rest of the group were caught in the middle of this conflict. They were not Jewish or Arab, and they didn't want any control of the land. They came wanting to bring peace and the love they had in Jesus. After the British Mandate, Palestine under international law was considered Jewish. The flag was half blue and half white, with a gold star of David in the center. Anna, who had witnessed so much in her life, passed away in 1923. Leaving her daughters, Bertha and Grace, and her son Jacob to continue the work. But God continued to use the Spafford family, once again with a Christmas story. By this time, Bertha was married and had children who had been born in Jerusalem. On Christmas Eve in 1925, Bertha was traveling to Bethlehem, meeting her husband and children for a Christmas celebration in Bethlehem. And along the way, she met a man, his wife, and a new baby who were traveling by donkey. The wife was very sick, and the Jewish couple had nowhere to stay. So, Bertha brought them to her home, and she tried to care for the family throughout the night. But the mother passed away, and in the morning, the man asked her to take care of his baby, and he left, and suddenly, Bertha had a baby in her care, who came to her on Christmas Day. She named the baby Noel. Then, a week later, she was asked to take care of two more babies. Bertha and Grace knew God was giving them a new mission. So the sisters turned their family home into an orphanage, which is how the Anna Spafford Children's Home was created. The sisters followed their mother's mission. They told everyone that they would treat anyone, regardless of what country they were from, regardless of what faith they believed in. They would care for any child in need. And this children's center is still in operation today. The Jewish people were scattered all over the world, 
Russia, and Eastern Europe, but most of the Jews stayed in those countries where they were. However, there was a large percentage of them that lived in the Arab countries. There was large groups of Jews in Egypt, Iraq, Algeria, and Morocco. Jews, who were living in Muslim countries, lived under what was called demi-status. They were second-class citizens, and they had a special tax they had to pay, and they didn't have the rights others in the land did. As the Ottoman Empire began to fall, some of those restrictions were lifted. But by then, many of the Jews had started moving to Palestine. Once the Ottomans no longer controlled them and the British had control of the land, the Jewish population in the Arab countries flocked to the land. Bertha and Grace continued their work all the way through World War II. They witnessed the birth of Israel in 1948 and the Six-Day War in 1967. We're going to talk about World War I and World War II and the birth of Israel and the Six-Day War in the future episodes. Since this podcast goes through church history in chronological order, there's a few more stories we have to tell between now and then. Through each of these episodes in our Zionist series, I have mentioned the Ezekiel dry bones vision. The Spafford family came to Israel when it was a valley of dry bones. They watched the bones as they moved together, the Jewish people from around the world moving to the Holy Land. They watched as the skeletons began to stand, helping them by planting trees and vineyards that grew alongside other farms, leaving the valley a thriving farmland instead of a valley of dry bones. They watched as the skeletons began to speak with the Hebrew language coming back to life. And they watched as the skeletons grew skin and became a great army that defeated their enemies when the Arab countries came at them and they defeated them all in just one week with the Six-Day War. They witnessed the greatest miracle the world has ever seen, other than, of course, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And you can read their story in the book, Our Jerusalem, An American Family in the Holy Land. Between the years of 6 and 4 BC, Jesus was born in Israel. He came to bring peace and goodwill to men. The Christmas of 1873, the Spafford family had unimaginable pain, but God gave them peace, and a song that God gave them brought peace to millions of people with the song, It Is Well With My Soul. The family then traveled to Jerusalem to bring peace and goodwill to others. They watched the Christmas miracle as Jerusalem was freed from the Turks. Then on Christmas Eve, they took in a baby boy and opened an orphanage that still exists today. They chose to love, serve, rescue, and bring peace through two world wars and conflicts. Anna and Horatio were reunited with their family in heaven in the arms of Jesus. In our world today, through all the turmoil and the conflicts, my question is, can you say, it is well with my soul? To end our episode, I am so thankful for the permission to play Tanira Strom and John Hochman singing It Is Well With My Soul. When I was looking for a version of the song to use, I was thinking about all the times I heard the story of the song. The story was always told from Horatio's point of view. But as I learned the story, I was drawn to the story of Anna. She was an immigrant to America who married an American and lived and served God while overcoming so much grief, including losing her husband when he was still so young, and then staying in Jerusalem without him through World War I. As I listened to this song with this amazing voice, I couldn't help but imagine Anna entering heaven and seeing Jesus Christ, who she served and loved, and then seeing her husband and children. This song is a beautiful reminder of peace that comes in a storm when we put our trust in God. Enjoy this beautiful song, and you can find her YouTube channel in the show notes below. You will want to follow her to hear more of her beautiful, amazing voice. When peace like a river 
Yeah.